Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God a big shout of praise. Lord, we worship you. Come on, lift up your voice to God. Lift up your voice to the King of Kings. We worship you, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the people after Thanksgiving said, Wow, that was really good. This so 1130 crowd, I'm I'll tell you, you what, you guys are always fired up. They did good. Well, we're going to work you today. We're going to get some of that turkey, you know, moved and all that. So I mean, I had a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. Anybody go out of town? A few of you? Okay. How many of you went, had people from out of town? Okay. So you had a few people. Anybody still eating turkey? Okay. You had some for this morning, you know. Right. We're getting creative milk now. Milk and turkey, yeah. yeah. Milk and turkey. Milk and turkey. Hey, you made me some uh, little ribs last night. I needed a break. They were good, that man. Was good we stuff. had beef short ribs in the instant pot. I'm yeah. telling you what. That is good. Those you need to take good. a break from it. But you know, we, I, we discovered with our German shepherds that our little puppy, she's what, about a, a little over a year yeah. old, she doesn't like turkey. And What's so. What's up with that? She I, I couldn't believe spit it. it on the ground. I know. She spit on the ground. I'm like, that is an expensive turkey compared to what What dog feeding. does not like turkey? This Ours. is crazy. All right, how many of you were the honorary turkey carver person? Oh, you were? Okay, how many of you men? How many of you men? So I decided, you know, because I had to carve the turkey, and let me just say this, last year we had like a 25 pound turkey, it was a really big one that you bought. Because I accidentally waited too long and that was all that yeah. was left. So, so I traded with the hares. So she traded with Shane and Christy. And last year our turkey was like a one pound turkey. I think it was like a little sparrow or something. It was <laughs> yeah. So, but this year I, I noticed something. We had, we had a somewhat interesting going on with our turkey this year. So I Googled, you know, how, how to carve a turkey. So Which I could, he does every year. Honey, I, I just needed a refresher. It's not like every week I'm carving a turkey, right? So I looked on Google, you know, and I had it down and and uh, she pulls out the turkey that was resting, right? No, I'm supposed to be resting, right? And so I look at this turkey and I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't look like anything like I saw on the Google. And you know what it was? He okay. thinks our turkey no, had a birth defect. It was, it was deformed. Okay, and I'm serious. God, you know this is true. So you know how you're supposed to cut off, okay, you know how like you have the drumstick and it hooks to the side of the bird and you kind of make that nice. I think they call it a thigh. Whatever that is, it, 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 you, you make that nice slice there. I'm not kidding. The drumstick piece, the bone was attached to the spine of the turkey. So when he was alive, he must have walked like this. I'm serious. So I couldn't cut it apart and I kept cutting it, cutting it. And by the time I got the whole thing cut, the, the thing was a mess. So it's always, turkeys, does it ever so anyway. cut like the picture? No, it's no. a mess. Right. It doesn't matter. It's a so, mess. Last question. How many survived Black Friday? Anybody go shopping? Okay, no, you're not, you're, not, you're not in sin, but how many of you went shopping on Black Friday? You did? Oh, my people. goodness. All right. You know why they call it Black Friday, right? Because it's evil. That's why nobody yeah, went. It's evil. And the reason why it's Black Friday, because the... The stores, they go to evil measures to convince you that the stuff is on sale. Let me give an example. You want a TV. Two months before Black Friday, that TV is $500. The day before Black Friday, that TV is $500. On Black Friday, it's $700 marked down to $500, $500. on sale. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, see, anyway, we better it's go. It's all crazy. It's, it's all, all crazy. crazy. I'm just glad I don't go. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I don't go. See, I'm hinting. I'm glad I don't go. Yeah, we're it. glad you don't go. All either. right. Well, I want to do this. I want to greet those of you that are watching around the world. Let us know what part of, well, the United States that you're watching from or what part of the world that you're watching from. And uh, let us know also if it's... Well, I don't think it's snowing because it's really kind of mild, but let us know what the weather is there. And I'm going to continue a message. Today, we talked about blind Bartimaeus again. And uh, we're really talking about how to position yourself for what God said. Yes. And it was a question that Jesus asked blind Bartimaeus, and it was this, what do you want me to do for you? And I really believe that 2022 is about settling that question. There are things that 
We've been believing God for, there are things that we are asking for, there's things that we need. We're going to talk also about the, the 10 lepers. And we're going to talk about what the one did. And I've heard, I know you've heard teaching on it, but I really want you to hear today something that is going to position you for something so great, I believe, in manifestation Praise in your God. life. And I really believe for our nation. Too. I believe that too. So, I believe that too. Are right. you excited? All right. And I want to make sure we welcome the chapel. God bless those of you that are seated in there. Let's all throw our hands up to heaven. All right. Wave Amen. them a little bit. Come on. Praise shake the God. turkey Thank out you. of your system. <laughs> and say this. Say, That's Lord Jesus. Funny. Lord Jesus. It's a great time. It's a great time. To be alive. To be alive. You've chosen me. You've chosen me. For Thank this divine season. For this divine season. So God, I'm ready. I'm ready. For everything, everything you have, you have for, me. for me. Now shout like you Thank believe you. it. Oh, and let's praise the Lord. God is helping you see the victory on the other side of the battle. And I believe the enemy has worked very hard, worked overtime for some of you to make you think that this will never get better. This that you've been in has been a long season. And I feel like you are recovering today from the effects of the battle. Recovering from the effects. Now, interestingly, Pastor prayed something in the nine o'clock that I, I really believe applies in here. So we're gonna pray it again, is that there were people who are recovering from the effects of COVID-19. Either there's some condition that you still feel in your body if you had COVID. Maybe you know somebody that's had COVID and they've never quite bounced back the same or they're still recovering. Some of you online, you've had COVID and you're bad. Now here's the thing. We're not glorifying COVID-19. We all know this thing has been manipulated by the powers of darkness. But we're not going to ignore it because some people have had it for real. But the point is, is we have the authority to stand up to that evil spirit because it is from the power of darkness. So if that's you, if you are in a place that you feel like you're still bouncing back, maybe you had COVID. I want you to lift your hand. And those of you online, stretch your hand. Now, believers around them, I want those of you that don't have your hand raised, I want you to go near those people and pray over them, agree over them, speak over their bodies, command healing. Just, I want everybody to maybe have a hand on somebody's shoulder and just agree with them that the power of the effects of COVID-19 is broken over the people of God. It has no right to remain. It has no authority. We take authority in the name of Jesus that a divine reversal occurs in your body right now. We prophesy in this room of the anointing, this room and this atmosphere of agreement. We say this thing reverses those of you watching in the name of Jesus. God is turning this thing. He is reversing this curse. We command your lungs to breathe correctly. We command all your five senses to function as they were designed and created in Jesus' name. We declare right now full restoration, full divine reversal, and that your body, every cell, every fiber, the, the the bones, the blood, your immune system, it all begins to function the way that God has designed and created it. We say COVID-19, you are broken, you are bound in Jesus' name. You get off of God's people and the authority of the name of Jesus. Now touch yourself, everybody. I feel that God is, and it's interesting you guys went into that song and that God, God will turn it around for good. I feel like so many of God's people in this season have gotten so stuck in their eyes on the battle. You know, it's tempting to do that sometimes. Sometimes you can be so looking at that diagnosis, what's happening, even if you try not to watch the news, people tell you stuff. Did you hear about... 
And so, you know, it's hard to turn off the noise. And sometimes the battle gets so intense on people. Which is why the prophet of God spoke and said, This 2022 is going to be about your life. And Pastor Chrissy said something. We were in the back room between services. She said, but for people who don't think that God will make it about you, Hebrews 11.6 is a scripture that says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And those that please God, right? Those that please God must believe that he is, number one. And here's there's a second part to it. That he's a rewarder. Woo! Come on, I believe the rewarder is in the room this morning and he is bringing gifts from heaven. He's bringing rewards from the throne of grace to come upon some of you that is long overdue. Come on, shout if you believe that. nugget I want you to go on because I feel like some blinders are getting stripped off of some of our vision there how did Jesus get through what he was about to suffer on the cross think for a moment the Bible says in Hebrews he had to look past it he had to look beyond what he was going to suffer for the joy that was set before him, he was able to endure the cross. Some of you, the devil has tried hard to get your countenance cast down. That's why David had to say, why are you cast down on my soul? Some of you, it's time to put your joy clothes back on and begin to rejoice and begin to be happy again. Begin to have a laugh in your mouth and a dance in your step. Some of you, it's time to shake off the heavy bands of the devil. Shake off the burden that's on your back. Jesus said, His burden is a light burden. Come on, some of you need to get happy right now in the house. Like God has won every battle that you have in front of you, can't lose. Come on, He will do it. yourself lay hands on yourself lay hands on yourself in faith say this say heavenly father I'm confident the battles around my life around my family members in this nation are temporary I'm winning I'm coming out on the other side I'll be better than I was before the upcoming season is going to be a good season because I won't have it any other way I'm confident in your promise good days are before me I'm going to live out my dreams I'm going to live out my calling I'm going to accomplish everything heaven has called me to do and Lord I thank you I'm going to do it strong I'm going to do it in wholeness I'm going to be well nothing is going to take me out devil you're bound take your hands off my life take your hands off my family take your hands off my children in the name of Jesus you get out of here now shout like you believe that. Hallelujah. All right. Do you have anything, Pastor? The only way the devil can get you to lose is if he can get you to agree with losing. 
don't agree. But Pastor Brenda, all of this is happening. You know what's going on around me. Oh, I'm sure if you wanted to go there, you could go there. But don't go there. Follow God. Don't follow the devil into the... You went, come on, you wouldn't run off a cliff if somebody told you to. So don't listen to the devil. Listen to God. He said, you're going to win. You're an overcomer. He's caused you to triumph. So don't let the battle get in the way of your victory. Amen. Okay, shout one more time in faith. And thank God. All right. So here's what you're going to do. Turn around. Take about two seconds. And prophesy to somebody near you. A word from the Lord that will tell them they're going to be a winner. And they're going to win every battle. Come on, tell somebody. Love on them. Tell them you're going to win. And you'll never lose in Jesus' name. got a good word today so I want to make sure we give him plenty of time to preach it preach the house down preach the paint off all of that so it is offering time and ushers you can be in the aisle with your off with the offering envelopes um, this is a good time for those of you giving electronic I can't speak it's too much glory in here I know I tell you <laughs> so here's the thing uh, those of you that are giving electronically that's the word Pull out your device and go ahead and get the apps open. If you've not downloaded the LOH app, make sure that you do that. And I just want to say this. They're going to put that giving information up on the screen for everybody on the Internet and those in this room. And I do want to tell you, Pastor and I, we are so thankful for you, all of you that support this ministry, that give faithfully, that sow and invest. In a few minutes, I am going to show the renderings again of our building because there's a lot of people that maybe haven't seen it or you're just joining us for the first time. And I want to show you the new sanctuary that we're building that'll be so much more sufficient than the one that we have now. So much more room and space to spread out a little bit. Everyone knows we've got the chairs just packed in here. You can barely, and the nine o'clock, there's not really a seat available. Some of you have spread to the 1130 and that's probably helpful, but you know, we keep as many chairs so people can find a seat, but the new space will seat 1500 people. Now I've had people write and say, but Pastor Brenda, that won't be enough. Well, it's what's in front of us. We're planning for the future and we're looking even past that. But on a Sunday, if we split it into two, that's still three times what we have now. So that's good, amen? And it'll be beautiful. Yeah, you can praise God for that. You can praise God for that. But I want to read a scripture before I show you these as you're preparing. And by the way, if you want to give to the building fund, there is a drop down on all of the electronic platforms that says building fund, or you can write that on your offering envelope. But this scripture is just, as we've kind of embarked on this, this scripture is from Exodus 35 and verse 5. And this was God commanding the pe Moses to tell the people to bring an offering for the tabernacle. How many of you remember those passages? And interestingly enough, the tabernacle was a temporary space, right? It was a temporary sanctuary. It was a temporary place for God's presence to dwell. And he said, take, you from among, take from among you an offering to the Lord, whosoever, so the call was to everybody, right? Who is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering to the Lord. And he begins to list the silver and the gold. So God was calling people of a willing heart to give an offering or to give a gift for an eternal purpose. Now, I was thinking about all of these people, right, that you look at right now, these millionaires and billionaires who have invested in the stock market and all of these things, you know, these different stocks. And some of them have become extremely wealthy doing it. And all of them will tell you that if you're going to invest like that or become that kind of investor, you have to just be willing to release those funds and let it sit there. You don't invest in it and then you want to pull it out next month. 
Okay, it's called long-term investing. Imagine the person that decided to buy Amazon stock before Amazon is what it is now. You can look up Berkshire Hathaway stock. I'm sure it wasn't always worth, I don't know, I looked it up one time, I was like, my eyes popped out. I'm like, okay, well. You know, most average people can't even buy a single share. But the people that have invested in that realize that they were investing for something that was is down the road. That's investment thinking. It's not something that you're gonna pull on anytime soon. When you look at the children of Israel here, they were building and willingly investing their funds in a temporary tabernacle. Now, they probably didn't realize what all the tabernacle meant. You know, when God set up all of these things in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple, and he had these intricate instructions on how everything was to be done, it was to point to something future. It was symbolic. So the tabernacle in the wilderness was the temporary place of God's dwelling. They didn't know it. But ultimately, the real tabernacle, come on, how many of you are filled with the Holy Ghost? The real tabernacle was not a tabernacle that was made with men's hands. It was to be spirit-filled believers who would inside themselves, come on somebody, carry the presence of the living God. I mean, think about... Here, God in the Old Testament is in a box, in a temporary tabernacle. And God was building it to point to you and me. So I thought, God, I bet none of those willing people had any idea what they were investing in. Because thousands of years later, their investment to build a temporary space was going to have an eternal value of spirit-filled people that would be carriers of the presence of God. Hallelujah! So I'm, I'm saying that because I want you to know that as you're giving today and you that are online and you're helping us build this sanctuary, you're tithing. Okay, Jesus called our tithes and offerings an investment. He said you're giving into the kingdom, that you are doing it not to build a temporary sanctuary. Okay, one day that sanctuary won't be here. But you're doing it to make a space where God can come and touch people and affect them for all eternity. Hallelujah! It's an eternal. And you know, those poor people, all those billionaires that give or invest their money in all these stocks, when they die, it's over. They don't get to take it with them. They maybe can leave it for somebody else, but they don't take it with them. For them, it's the end of the line. For us, when we invest in God's purposes, it carries right on into eternity and has an eternal reward. That is awesome. All right, so stand up on your feet, and we're going to show the pictures real quickly. I want you to look at them, and everybody online, if they put up the renderings of the sanctuary. I want you to get a vision. This is maybe a temporary tabernacle, but it's a place where people come. Now, let me just show the other picture. This is kind of the middle of the building. Show the one, guys, of the... Okay, well, I can do it off that one. Let's... So, if you just look at the building, see the canopy that comes out into the parking... Yeah, there's the one I want to show. That canopy that comes out into the parking lot there is kind of where what has already been remodeled in the space... Um, ends. We remodeled this building in 2018, 2019, and the only thing we really didn't change on shape and size was this sanctuary. We just recarpeted and all of that, but we kept it the same knowing that the next step was to build this bigger space. And so the space that's done is from, if you see that on the right of the screen, that first kind of cedar panel there, that entrance is just right out here in front of our auditorium and then there's that middle gray section with the windows at the center of the building that is the children's department uh, right in front of there in front of that arc if you go out and then there's this the next right about center that cedar panel which is the connect center and we call it the connect center because it's pretty much the center of the building 
and it connects the two ends. So there's a lot of things with that, but that's the connect center where the chapel is. And then it goes over just a little farther and that where that shadow is, that's kind of where we stopped. And then everything after that is the old structure. And the plan is as soon as spring comes, we're gonna start demolishing that. The sanctuary will seat 1,500 people with a roof deck of about 50 feet. That cross tower, which was Matthew's idea, by the way. He said, Mom, what kind of church is a church without a cross on top? So thank you, Matthew. Because we originally didn't have one, and so he pitched a fit about that. So there's a cross, Matt. So the cross tower is about 75 feet uh, up in the air, and that whole section will be a brand new auditorium. And it's gonna be pretty amazing because the balcony will extend out over the front foyer. So um, what the architect has designed is pretty, pretty impressive. And so the plan is to have that done. In, and so one thing you guys can pray is acceleration early 2023. It's gonna take them about a year to build it. So we have to all keep piling in here for a little while. But as you're sewing, I want you to get a vision that inside that space is going to be healings, deliverances, salvations, people you thought never would come to God are going to come in there. I believe that is the season that we're coming into in the kingdom of God. Such a harvest of people that say, I can't live anymore without God in my life. And I'm just saying over it right now, in fact, I feel this from the Holy Spirit. We call that a miracle house. We call forth, we call forth a miracle house. Father, we pray it out right now. And we say, Lord, let that miracle house be a place of signs and wonders. Father, people get up out of wheelchairs, people with terminal conditions, people that run to the altar to be saved. Father, we say, let it be a place where signs, wonders, miracles, Father, things that will absolutely shock human reasoning. God, you've done it before. Let it be here. Come on, say it with me. We call it a house of miracles. Hallelujah. Say, we declare it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. That's what you're giving into. And you know, and I feel, I'm just going to say this. I got to be quiet because pastor needs to speak. But believe your loved ones will be in there. Some of you have loved ones that are out there. They've gone off track. You know, let's use our faith. Don't let the devil tell you they'll never get saved. Don't let the devil tell you. Okay, if, if Saul could become Paul, it took a minute and he was knocked off the horse. Start getting a picture of that. In fact, I'm gonna, we're going to pass out pictures of these coming up. And I want you to get that, put it in your Bible, say, God, my prodigals are coming home. My family's getting saved. They're going to get in that building and they're going to get born again and they're going to get healed. Father, I thank you. And Jesus, well, I mean, we can believe it before in here, but we can fit more of them in there. So come on, let's believe God together. Praise the Lord. All right, hold up your offering. I just want you to get a, a vision of what's happening. I'm gonna pray for you and Matthew's gonna come. But Father, as they're holding up their offerings and devices, oh Jesus, we just, first of all, God, we just wanna say we are willing people. We're willing to let you move. We're willing, Father, to give. We're willing to rally behind the harvest that has been prophesied. And Father, we won't accept anything except that everything you want to do in this space will be accomplished. And Father, our loved ones are going to come in. Our friends, our neighbors. Father, we stand and we believe you for it. Father, those that we've witnessed to, they're going to run in to come into the kingdom of God. Father, the kingdom is preached and every man presses in. And that's where we stand in faith and we thank you for it. Now, Father, I ask that every person that is investing in the kingdom of God, Father, it's your promise. Not only is it eternal, but that you would bless them in this lifetime. Give a hundredfold fold houses, lands, blessings. Father, family, friends, give them a hundredfold, Father, as they make this investment. And I thank you. Father, I don't know, that just hit my spirit. 
You're the God of the, the now payout and the God of the eternal. God, the stock market can't do it. <laughs> but you can do it in the now and in the months to come and all through eternity. God, you're amazing. And we just say thank you. Say thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. All right, Matthew, come on and help us. I, I know you've got it. a little announcement to make, but help us prophesy I over gotta that. i got to say this, too, in regards to what you And let's welcome Pastor Hank. Hey, just a minute. So praise God, Pastor Brenda. I just want, real quick, you to tell them next week, while the ushers are serving the people and you're giving online. So you're going to preach next Sunday. Tell them yep. we were praying together. Uh, actually, we, I was studying this morning, and then we went to prayer. But you told me a little bit about what next week's message is along the same theme. Yes, can exactly. You, Talking about 2022, I get so much revelation on the front row when pastor's preaching. And uh, the Holy Spirit reminded me this week of something. He said, there is a cry that I listen to. And that is the cry that comes from God out of the righteous. And we're going to talk next week about the cry of the righteous that is going to shift this nation, that's going to shift your life, that's going to shift people around you. It's going to cause changes. And we're going to learn how to cry out in the spirit and cause the devil to be on the run. Not a squalling and a bawling. That's right. Not not a squalling and a bawling. Well, you're my favorite preacher, so we're excited for that. I'll come and listen to you. Okay. Pastor Doug, we're, as they're continuing to serve the people, I just want to remind you, those of you that are watching, Tuesday night will be Flashpoint, and uh, I'm not sure the guests, I think it's the regular four of us, but sometimes they put another person in there. Then Wednesday night, I want you to join me here live. Uh, I'm going to preach uh, midweek service here, so I want you to join us. It'll be a great time of preaching the Word, and, and uh, those of you online, you can join us. And then Thursday will be Elijah Streams. Uh, with Steve Schultz, and I think it's at 1 o'clock Central, so that's kind of the week. But uh, we have something coming up that's very exciting. Brenda and I are very excited to join the people. Pastor Doug, can you give yes. us some, because today's the deadline, so today they got to register the today. deadline to buy so. your tickets for the Christmas in Space event, which will be held at the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum that's just right outside of Omaha, exit 426. I think it's an Ashland exit, yeah. and that's December 10th. Get your tickets today because this is our deadline. How many of you have got your tickets already? Oh, good. Okay, we need more, and uh, they're filling up fast. Get those because we're going to have fellowship, a great Christmas buffet meal with pastors there. Yep, I'm going to go buffet you. my body. Yes, <laughs> and Santa will even be there to take your picture. So <laughs> and have your Santa picture will be so, there. Yeah, so it's going to gonna be a great time. All right, uh, yeah. Uh, Brenda, we need to show them the one that I got taken with, with, when I was for you. I'll bring it. We'll talk about that later. So, all right. How many are ready to get in the word? Yeah. Praise God. I want to say this, you know, it's been a good Thanksgiving. The only thing that I heard about was the fleet of trucks that uh, was carrying sinus medication and uh, they overturned, spilled, and uh, the medication is ruined. And uh, boy, it created quite a congestion. <laughs> so. How many of you really thought that that was... Now, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know what they did in the first service when I told that? You won't even believe what the first service did. They, some booed me. I'm serious. I got booed. That, that joke just got booed, you know. And uh, So here's the thing. You know, people that booed or went like, yeah, that's a stupid joke. You know when you go out of this place today, you're going to call somebody up and you're going to use it. You know you are. You're going to tell somebody at the restaurant and... Uh, I was going to say, hey, did you hear about the fleet of trucks that were carrying chewing gum and they overturned, but it's now a a gummy mess and a sticky situation and um, they all got chewed out and so, you know, but that was not as as, convincing as this one. I'm a comic book writer. I have to think of everything, so. Hey, how many of you watched Flashpoint on Thanksgiving and they showed you the Mayflower upside down? Did you get my joke? Pastor Gene, if you're watching, you didn't even get the joke, you know, about how they turned the Mayflower upside down and the guy made a barn out of it. And it's over in England. And I talked about, boy, I'm sure there was a lot of shipping and handling involved. And he didn't even get the joke. It went right over his head. But you, you all got it. So, all right, open your Bible to Mark chapter 10. I like a good joke, you know. So... How many, how many ever met somebody as you're turning Mark 10 that it's like, I know I knew one guy that every time you talked to me always had a new joke. I'm like, what, what do you do? Read like 
<laughs> bubble gum wrappers all day. It's like, don't you have anything else to do? How many of you know somebody like that? And sometimes, well, this dude, his jokes were kind of, you know, that's back before I was a Christian. Like, you know, yeah, you're at a, never mind. Anyway, we don't need to talk about him. Go to Mark chapter 10. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about a blind man named Bartimaeus. And we're going to talk about you that are watching because I really want you to position yourself for what God has been saying. Now, as I have been seeking the Lord for the last few months, about 2022, 2021, I really felt like the Lord said, I'm going to make 2022 be about the people because of what the harshness of the season that people have been through. As the scripture says in Hebrews 11, Brenda, uh, Pastor Brenda quoted it, and that is that God's a rewarder for those that diligently seek him. People get hung up with their religious mindset that, oh, it's all about Jesus. Nobody's saying that it isn't. In fact, the more you focus on him, you become his focus. And so you have to understand that God is the one that is saying, hey, because of what you've been through, I really want to do something special for you. I really want to make it about you. Now, our job is to continue to make it about him. And in return, he makes it about us. That's just the way God is. And so uh, don't get hung up on it or you'll miss your blessing. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 46, notice what happens. And they came to Jericho, and later as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, there was a large crowd and a beggar. Now, stop right there, because if you read it in other gospel accounts, like in the book of Matthew, for example, it mentions that there were two blind men, two beggars. But for whatever reason, and this is important, I'm going to come back to this later, that Mark leaves out the details of the two uh, you know, blind men, one being Bartimaeus here, and he leaves out and kind of has different details. But we see this story, blind man Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting on the road or by the road, and when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out. How many know this is the time to lift up our voice? It's time for our voice to be heard. It's time for us to cry out for our freedoms. Amen? That's really what he was doing. I don't want to be blind anymore. Amen? The cry of freedom is one of the greatest things that you have as a human being. Don't let anybody mandate it and take it from you. And notice what he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David. Now, it's interesting that he used the word Jesus, thou son of David, because he was connecting himself to the covenant. That was the Abrahamic covenant, Jesus, thou son of David. That was covenant cry. It wasn't just like Pastor Brendan said, where you're, you know, crying and squalling and bawling, complaining, murmuring, being negative. No, this was a cry basically demanding his covenant rights. And he said, notice what his cry was, have mercy upon me. And notice it wasn't just a cry. You know, I mean, obviously there's things that are affecting the world. There's things that are affecting the nation. But how many of you have ever had it when it hits home? There's a cry that begins to say, God, hey, I need you to do something for me. And God's heard it. And that's what he's going to do. And so he's saying, what do you want me to do for you? I, I, this, is, this is about you. And, and blind Bartimaeus was crying out, God, have mercy on me. In other words, let the whole world stop. I need you to focus on me. I mean, how many of you ever felt that way before? And watch this. Have mercy on me. Now, verse 48, many were sternly telling him to be quiet. Have we not heard the same thing? Be quiet. Shut up the church. Shut it down. You're not essential. Okay, there's been so many attempts to try to shut us up. But notice what blind Bartimaeus did. He didn't stop. He kept crying out. All the more. In other words, the more they push stuff, you got to push back. Amen. And if you keep pushing back, God already said it ahead of time that it'd become a great put it back. Yes. But I want you to look here at verse 48. Notice his cry was, have mercy on me. And many sternly told him to be quiet. So there was a, a resistance. There was an opposition. People often ask me, well, Pastor Hank, how do you know? that God is literally going to turn things around. Well, for one, I don't know about you, but I have, before all the weird stuff going on now, I've seen the future. Well, how did you see the future? God showed it to me. You mean God shows people the future? Yes, he does. He shows throughout the whole Bible. There's people that have seen the future. Listen, if you read the book of Revelation, Apostle John uh, was shown the future, and people argued over like crazy. They're still trying to figure out what he saw. And so God does show the future. He shows us things that are to come, 
things that are, things that were. But here's the bottom line. I'm going to tell you two simple things. Maybe God hasn't showed you the future. Maybe you don't know what the future holds. Maybe you're afraid of the future. But I'm going to show you two things that are key indicators of God's action or movement. I'm going to talk about this on Wednesday. I'm going to talk about God's compassion. That's one of the things that the Lord is doing. I'm going to talk about some things on Wednesday that I think will really encourage you. But here's the first thing. <laughs> when there starts to be a cry, not a complaining cry, but when there's a cry that goes up to the ears of God and Jesus stops or it gets his attention. Now, I want you to look here. He cries out, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. People told him to be quiet. He kept crying out, but notice Jesus' reaction. Verse 49, what did Jesus do? Jesus stopped. Now, you have to pay attention to things like that. Jesus stopped or Jesus sat down. You know how many times the Bible says Jesus sat down? And most people read over that, for example, where it says Jesus sat down. And they don't realize that you have to look at that word and what it means. It literally means it's not some passive sitting down. It literally is like an action verb, but what, what the Greek word is, when Jesus sat down many of the times where he sat down in a boat or he sat down on a rock, is a Greek word called kathizo. And literally what it means is, even though he's seated and, or sitting down in the natural, that's not what, what, where he's really seating, sitting. He's seated, seated in a heavenly seat of authority. So when Jesus sat in the boat, or he sat on a rock, it was cathizo. Yeah, he was naturally there, but he was speaking and operating and functioning from a higher place of authority. People just thought he was sitting on a rock, but the devil knew, uh-oh. They even said it, who's this man that speaks with such authority? Because he was carrying a higher authority. In Acts chapter 7, there was a, a disciple named, or a follower of Jesus named Stephen. And he was stoned by them throwing rocks at him. Remember that. And you have to pay attention. The Bible says in, in, in the book of Revelation that when the apostle John saw the Lamb of God or saw Jesus, what was Jesus doing? He was seated at the right hand. Now, that doesn't mean that he's always seated at the right hand like Jesus doesn't move around. But you have to understand, in Acts 7, when they're stoning Stephen, he looks up and he sees Jesus standing up. In other words, it got his attention. So what we have to then look at is what are some things that causes God to respond or gets his attention? Okay, are you here? So notice he kept crying out and Jesus stopped. So how do we know that things are going to get turned around? I can tell you right now, there has been and there is a determined cry from a few remnant in the church. Don't ever think it's about the masses. People say, well, the church just needs to repent. Well, wait a minute, how much are you talking about? Because God looks at, and there's always been a remnant. It says in the book of Romans that the, the devil's time has been cut short because of the remnant, God has, has saved it. You look at the 300 of Gideon's army, you look at the 120 remnant after 500 saw Jesus be raised from the dead and 120 were in the upper room. Okay, it wasn't the masses that gathered that really God used to make a difference. But there is a remnant cry right now in the earth, Lord, have mercy. We are not going to take this, God. We are asking for righteousness. We are demanding your justice. And I'm not talking about the complainers on social media. I'm not talking about the people that are giving up. I'm not talking about the people that have their heads stuck in the sand. I'm not talking about the people that their perspective is not the scripture, it's the television set. I'm talking about the remnant church that are saying, you know what, all that, we're crying out to God. We are looking and expecting you to do something. That's A, how you know, because just like Jesus stopped here for blind Barnabas, he backs up, he stands up off the throne, whatever, and he begins to take notice. I'm telling you, he's taken notice. And God's been speaking to me a lot about this. And one thing we know is scripture says in Psalm 37, in verse 9, don't fret, don't be anxious, don't worry. Why? Because it says that evildoers will be cut off. And those that wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. We don't know how to wait. And then it says in that same chapter of Psalm, it says in verse 13 that God is laughing. Well, why is he laughing? Because he says he sees their day coming. 
And when there's a cry from the people in faith to God, he stops and he deals with, with what's the foundation of his throne, righteousness and justice. Now, what's the next way that you know that things are getting ready to turn around? Here's how you know. The devil only attacks what he's threatened by. If he wasn't threatened by the church, he wouldn't be attacking it like he is. If he wasn't threatened by the healing movement, he wouldn't be using a virus. <laughs> Are you here? If he wasn't threatened by America, he wouldn't be trying to Marxist and socialize us. Right? He's threatened by the future of this nation. That's why he's trying to take away our freedoms. So the enemy only attacks what he's afraid of. So you look at what is being pushed. What is being shoved? What is being mandated? Why? There's something connected to it that has a redemptive plan. Are you listening? America's part of God's redemptive plan of the last days. Or these days, I should say. So the other thing that you look for is not only the enemy attacks what he's threatened by, but the enemy always responds to something that God is doing. When Jesus would walk into a town... They throw the devil would throw would, would use people throw himself on the ground say Jesus thou son of David uh, get away from us leave us alone what have you come to torment us before our time when Jesus would come into a city the devil would send a storm Mark chapter four to try to kill him and the disciples come on when the apostles were carrying the glory of God what did the devil do try to beat him imprison him stop him so the enemy when he responds or reacts to things it's a good indicator that things are about to shift. Now, the same thing we see here, you have to see with blind Bartimaeus. How do you know that blind Bartimaeus' day was about to shift? Number one, he cried out and Jesus stopped. <laughs> Just like what I'm telling you. Number two is there was opposition immediately to try to counter him from receiving anything. Notice they sternly told him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more. Jesus stopped, called him there. He threw off his cloak. And Jesus said, now this is what I want you to look at right now, and those of you that are watching, this is the question that the Lord is asking. Verse 51, Jesus said, now who instigated this question? Jesus. And notice what he said, what do you want who? Me, so he includes himself. What do you want me to do for you? In other words, blind Bartimaeus, your whole season's about to change. Your whole situation's about to change. And if you will include me in the request that I'm asking you, you're going to see an immediate result. He said, what do you want me to do for you? And notice blind Bartimaeus. He didn't go, oh, but, but Jesus, it's all about you. <laughs> he didn't do that and get religious like some folk. And write on social media, false prophecy. Well, that's your problem. Yeah. That's right. He's, are you kidding Jesus is the one instigating it. Through the mouth of the, the servant here, he said, do you tell the people 2022 is about them? I will bless them. And, and, I, and I'm not done with my message. People report, oh, it's all about Jesus. You haven't even heard my message. <laughs> okay? You haven't heard what I'm just, you know, from headquarters trying to tell you. And so he, he didn't say, oh, I'm not worthy. He didn't even complain. You don't know about all the years of blindness that I've been through. See, stop doing that. If he's asking you a question, what do you want me to do? You take him up on it. No, no further questions. No reasoning it. Here. And notice he was specific. I want to receive my sight. Come on, what do you need for God to do? And immediately his sight was restored. Notice it didn't take years, because when God implements or instigates something, he's serious. And if you will connect your faith to what he's saying, you will get the same immediate results. I've had the Lord do that with me. I've had the Lord say to me before, Hank, I want to bless you. What do you want? Wow, well, since you're instigating it, this is what I want. When he told me to buy this building, I didn't want to buy the building. He told me three times when I connected my faith and did what he said, I said, God, all I'm asking you is make it beautiful. And he has. 
And so I've watched God do this too many times. Now, here are four key things that I want you to position yourself for for 2022 that are very, very important. 2022, you say, well, what about 2021? Okay, there goes your negative side. Okay, 2022 is also about the spoil of some of the victories that you didn't think you had in 2021, W-O-N. You watch. I'm serious. We're going to talk about that. You don't get spoiled unless you've been through something. Well, 2020, does it feel, feel like it's 2021? It's 2020 battle. Well, position yourself because there's some spoil. Because you're going to see it is 2021. You may not see it during the year of battle, but you will after. Now, here's the thing. 2022 shall be known also as 2020 true. God is going to bring the level of exposure to a whole nother level so that we are going to see truth. He's had it up to here with lies. Now... I've heard people quote things like, well, you know, murderers and adulterers and all the bad sins are going to have their place in the lake of fire. You know what's also included? Liars. God doesn't like lying. And there's a whole lot of lying going on, and especially when it causes whole nations to be affected at the level of what we are seeing. God has had enough. And then for people to point their finger at the ones that are telling the truth and calling them liars, that does not make God very happy. So it'll be 2022, 2020 true. It'll be 2020 new. There is a new season. Blind Bartimaeus got a new season by answering the question that God is asking. What do you want me to do for you? I want something new. God, I want to receive my sight. Come on, what do you need that's new? Here's the other thing. The third thing is God remembers. What, mean the Lord doesn't remember? No, the Lord knows everything. But there comes a point where there are times where God stops and he focuses on something concerning you, concerning a nation, or even concerning himself, that he puts himself in remembrance. And when God puts himself in remembrance, look out. There will be a whole lot of things to pay if you're a bad guy. I'll show you from Scripture. When God put himself in remembrance, he dealt harshly with the enemy. I can show you Scripture. When God put himself in remembrance, a whole nation, I feel the anointing, a whole nation was delivered. A whole nation was delivered overnight. When God puts himself in remembrance, I'm telling you, it is amazing. And the Lord said to me, and I told this to Brenda yesterday when I was studying, I said, Brenda, I just heard the Holy Spirit gave me a scriptural example and said, tell the people the king remembers. And then he showed me a passage where the king remembered. And when the king remembered, you will see that it is about you. Can I give you a hint? Mephibosheth, King David, who represents our God, invited a man who thought he was a dog to the table, and his season changed overnight, and he got royal treatment. This is where we're heading. It's going to be true. It's going to be new. God's going to remember. There's a whole list of things we're going to preach about that one, and it'll be about you. So you have to understand where we're heading. Now, I want you to look here before you answer the question or you get your list. What is something that we need to make sure that we always remember when it comes to making things about us? It's about your heart motive. It's about the spirit in which you ask. I remember one day I was rolling off my list of prayer. And I mean, I was just rolling it off. And the Lord said to me, you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. He said, well, why don't you ask me for things that you don't need yourself to do? And I looked at my list and I thought, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I could do that. If God doesn't answer, I could choose to do that. God doesn't do that. I could make that happen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I realized, whoa, 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 wait. I am being too limited or limiting of God. And so I said, all right, well, if you really want me to ask you things that only you can do, 
Then here, and I, and, I, and I laid out a whole bunch of things. And here's the thing. The scripture says to the God who does, watch this, ex- exceedingly, yes. abundantly, beyond yes. all that we ask or think. You mean to tell me that God wants a, yeah, he wants to be involved. He wants to get the glory. So don't limit him. But here's the thing. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 20. Now, this is the same story. But it, it, it doesn't seem to have quite the same details that Mark's account that we just read out of. Those of you that are watching, this is important. How many of you are married in here? Raise your hand if you're married. Everybody married. Okay, now how many of you, your husband, your wife, they both go to the store. And, and uh, if, if Brenda goes to the store and I say, Brenda, uh, did you go to the store? She would say yes. That's all she'd say, yes. Well, where'd you go? I went here. Well, what'd you get? And she'd show me. And not because she's rude, just Brenda's just not detailed that way. Now, Brenda, if you ask Hank where I was at. Well, Brenda, I was at this store, that store, every store. And this is what I got. And the sky was blue and parked next to me was a guy that I could tell he had a demon. And Brenda, as I walked in, I saw this incredible uh, looking uh, truck that went by. And as the truck went by, the Lord told me this. And then as I looked up, I saw something. And when I went into the store on aisle 14, there was this. How many guys or people are like that? You're just extremely detailed. Right? So Mark leaves out some of the stuff. He just kind of gets to the point, right? He doesn't mention there's two blind men. He just says, hey, there's a guy named Blind Bartimaeus. In Mark's account, he talks about how there were two, two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Matthew's account, it looks like it wasn't James and John, or they may have, have come to Jesus to ask him to sit at his right hand. But in, in Matthew's account, it looks like maybe they got their mom involved too. So what I'm trying to show you is... This is a different account. It's not a contradiction how some people want to make you think because the details aren't the same, even in comparison of the stories. You follow me? Did you get that? All right, this is important because look at Matthew chapter 20. Let's start with verse 18. Notice what Jesus is talking about. And you have to put yourself in, in this situation. If Jesus was walking with you or you were sitting down by the brook and Jesus began to say, hey, Boys, we're going up to Jerusalem. The son of man, talking about himself, hey, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests, to the scribes, and they're going to condemn me to death. Would you keep skipping rocks? You'd be like, huh? Notice what he says. And they'll hand me over to the Gentiles to be mocked. They're going to whip me. I'm going to be crucified, and on the third day, though, I will be raised again. Now, Go to verse 20. Now the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him. Now, Mark's account says that it was James and John. So which one is it? Is it the boys that came to Jesus or is it this account, the mother? It could be that it was both. That Mark, the boys first came to Jesus and asked the question. They didn't get a good answer. Or maybe the answer that he eventually tells him. So let's get mom. Come on, how many of you parents have been set up by your kids? All right, let me ask these guys. You're young. How many of you ever set up your, your parents? Sure you have. Hey, yes you have. I know because I, I used to do that too, right, mom? And so you, you, you set them up. And so I really believe that the boys probably came to Jesus first and kind of was hitting around. And they didn't get the right answer, so let's get mom. So there's a wrong motive, yes or no? Is there pride involved? Yeah. Watch what Jesus says, because you're going to see there's two questions that he asks. And it comes down to motive and having the right heart. So in Matthew 20, let's go back there. He says, the mother of Zebedee approached Jesus with her sons, and notice how she manipulates. She kneels down. I'm submissive. No, you're manipulating woman. Come on, how many have ever seen a manipulating woman? Oh, some of the ladies are going, oh, yes. How many men have ever seen a manipulating woman? Some of the guys are like, we ain't sane, man. We are not sane. But stereotype-wise, 
it doesn't usually, men wouldn't just come and kneel down. Men would be like, um, hey, yeah, Lord, you know, they'd be all like, act, you know, doing this, you know, and trying to all act, you know, mosquito, you know, and you know, just kind of all. No, but the woman comes and kneels down, and I guarantee she bats her eyes, who knows, right? And notice what she does. She kneels down. She, she's got the wrong spirit, the wrong motive. There's some manipulating going on. Do you really think that that's the way to ask Jesus for something? Be careful. Because some of us are guilty of that. Look at verse 21. Jesus responds not with, what do you want me to do for you? He says, what do you want? He could see right through a manipulating, prideful, yes or no. Hint, hint, ladies. Hint, hint, man. There, I'll put equal. I have to make it equal because I'm going to get written about, right? What do you want? He asked her. And notice how she still manipulates. Promise me, she said to him, that my two sons, who are better than all your disciples, yeah, I see right through that, may sit one on your right and one on your left. That's really what she was saying. Hey, my two boys are favored. They're holy. They've done more miracles. They're the sons of thunder. Promise me that they're going to sit on your right hand and on your left. And I think the boys had already tried to manipulate Jesus, and I think he had enough. Because look at what he says. Look at his answer. Jesus said, you don't even know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup? I think he raises his voice up now so the boys can hear. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said, oh, we're able. And he's like, mm hmm sure. They said to him, we're able. And he told them, you will indeed drink my cup. And he goes on. But notice that he asked them, what do you want? He didn't even include himself. What do you want me to do? Because the Lord is not included when we are prideful, arrogant, and have wrong motives. But if you're coming to God and saying, you know, the harshness of the season, Lord, divided my family. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to restore my family. That's not selfish. Lord, I'm tired of being lonely. And God, I will continue to seek you as my God or my husband or whatever. And Lord, I thank you that you are bringing my request. I want my help meet. What's wrong with that? That's not a wrong motive. So you have to understand that he asks the question, what do you want? I don't want God to say that to me. What do you want? In other words, you're asking with the wrong motive. But now go down to verse 32 and let's bring ourselves back in remembrance of what did Jesus say to blind Bartimaeus? When Jesus heard him cry out, he stopped. And notice what he said. What do you want me to do for you? Now, remember the story. Was that a selfish request of blind Bartimaeus? Help me. I want to see. Have mercy on me. That's not a selfish request. It's not with the wrong motives. And notice that he included Jesus, blind Bartimaeus. He said, thou son of David. He was acknowledging God. He was acknowledging his covenant. Have mercy on me. And notice what Jesus did. Immediately, he healed him. He immediately got his answer. It wasn't, what do you want? So I think there's some things that go on. I want you to look here. I want to show you something. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want you to look at verse 18. This is extremely important that we, we understand. We just celebrated Thanksgiving. And uh, some people say, well, it wasn't a very good Thanksgiving. Well, maybe it wasn't, but the Bible gives us a very, very strong clue of how to position ourselves to please God, to receive from God, and to have a right spirit. A grateful heart is a soft heart. Do you know why? And, and I'm not picking on the young people. I'm just making an observation. Have you noticed today's generation of the young are mean-spirited? Not all of them. You guys, I think you guys are wonderful. I think you're terrific. I think you're huge. Okay. So I think you're great. But, but, but I have. I've never seen such mean-spiritedness in my, in my life. Opinionated. Why? Because there's something about the younger generation where the mean spirit is coming out. They feel like they're entitled or they didn't get something. It's because it comes down to not being grateful. It's true. I've seen marriages. You know why marriages are, are, are some of them are just a mess and you could tell they're not close? It's because they're not grateful for one another. 
They're not thankful for one another. You know what's so amazing about Brenda that I just absolutely adore about her? I will do something stupid like put, I mean, I think it's, it's not stupid, but I'll put a dish that is, laying, is, is on the counter, I'll put it in the dishwasher, or I'll start the dishwasher if I see it full, or I'll take the garbage out, or if, it, if I see her, her shoes on the floor, I'll go upstairs and put them away for her. And she always says to me, thank you, Hank. She's grateful. And you know what it does when I see that grateful response from her? It makes me all the more want to look for ways to make her happy and to please her. And, and, and I do the same for her, right? I, I Sure, I know I do. I believe I do. If not, okay. So, so, but notice what it says. Does it say in 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm almost done if they can come to the piano. In everything, give thanks. Okay, now stop there. Because I've had Christians take this verse and when they get attacked with sickness, oh, Lord, thank you for this sickness. Thank you that you're trying to teach me. That's, that's not, no, because the Lord is not the one, John chapter 10, that steals, kills, or destroys your life. Jesus made it very clear. He said, that's the devil. That's the thief. He says, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Now, what do you do if you have sickness? How do you give thanks? You say, Lord, I thank you. That even though this sickness is trying to attack my body, you, I thank you, have given me the answer. I am already healed according to covenant. And I thank you that by your stripes I am healed. I thank you, Lord, that this sickness will not reign in my body. I thank you, Lord, that this is not my future, nor is it my present. Because my covenant demands that I'm fully healed and restored. Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm broke. No. 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 Lord, I thank you I married a jerk. No, no, no. Lord, I thank you. That devil comes out of him. <laughs> All the ladies, yes, that's right. Glory to God. My, my husband gets delivered. But I want you, I'm going to end with this story. Are you ready? In every, no, let me go back here real quick. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God. In other words, in everything, giving thanks. And you that are watching, it's about behavior. Like Brenda said on Wednesday, if you caught our our heart to your home. I thought that was brilliant, by the way, Brenda. It's about your behavior. People who are ungrateful, their behavior emulates that or or reflects that, you know, they're mean-spirited, you know, they think everybody owes them something. But when you're grateful and you really have that kind of spirit, I'm telling you, it positions you for blessing. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. People say, well, what's the will of God? Give thanks. Give thanks. You know, I remember we had our air conditioner go out, and I mentioned this on our our show that we did. And for you, that may not mean anything, but boy, when it's hot, and you have German shepherds, those are my kids, and and you have a wife, you you have a wife, you got to take care of her, right, above the German shepherds, and it's hot, and you know that if the air conditioner went out, that it's probably not going to be a cheap fix. Well, it was expensive, because not only did they have to replace the, the air conditioner, they had to replace the heating unit. Because it was all one unit. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, Lord, I'm trying to get ready to go on vacation. Really? That's what I wanted to say out of my mouth. How many of you are like me? You just don't, sometimes you got to just kind of back yourself up and zip it. And so everything inside me wanted to just let God know. I would never bring an indictment against him, but boy, I sure will let something know, somebody know that I don't like this. But you know what? I disciplined myself, and I'm not holier than you are. I just said, you know what? No. And I went in. I said, Brenda, they're saying we need a new unit. She said, praise God. I said, glory to God. Yes. And inside, I'm like, it was like one of those. Yes. Right? It's like the kid that goes stand in the corner. And he stands in the corner, but on the inside, you know he's sitting down. Yeah, like that. So I want to show you how to increase your blessing. Let's go to the last story. In Luke 17, now think about this. How do you want, or how, let me just say this. How do we position ourselves for a higher blessing? I'm going to show you. But how many of you would like to have your new upcoming season be as if it never, ever happened? The struggle, the pain, the hardship the harshness of what you went through. Come on, how about for America? Do you know that this is biblically possible? That you can come into that level of blessing that it's as though it never happened. 
Let's read. And it came to pass as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of uh, Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, watch, have mercy upon us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. Stop right there. Notice it was the priest that determined what was a plague, what required, what required, a, what's the word, a, a quarantine. Boy, they don't give the church any voice. Right? Separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. No, it was really the church was to influence the state, just like the priests were the ones. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. Okay, there was a healing that took place. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and notice what he did. With a loud voice began to glorify God. And he fell down on his face at his feet and gave thanks. He was a Samaritan. Stop right there. Notice what he did. He wasn't quiet about his gratitude. Too many people are quiet about their gratitude. When it comes to praise and worship, it's why I, I don't think we need to be expressionless. I think we need to learn to thank God, lift up our voice, be loud. Notice another thing he did. He fell down. That's the highest form of worship is falling down. Being on your face. That's why Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, Hey, now is the time. He first said to her, you don't know. He says, you worship, you know not what. So he established she didn't even know anything about worship. And he said, now is the time and shall be that the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. And that word true worshipers, it literally means to bend down uh, to the ground as if, as if to kiss it. When the devil showed up to tempt Jesus, in Luke chapter 4 and in the, in the wilderness, remember what he said? If you be the Son of God, stand there and worship me. No. He said, bow down and worship me. In other words, like if you were to kiss the ground. So this is what this man does. He loudly gives gratitude and thanks to God. He bows down to the ground and he gave thanks for he was a Samaritan. And I talked about that in the morning service. Uh, that's very important, but for the sake of time. Watch what happens. Jesus said, hey, uh, where are there not ten that were cleansed? Where are the other nine? Now, keep in mind something about leprosy as I'm closing. Leprosy was the kind of disease that they would put him in camps because it was highly contagious. It was a very deadly, spreadable disease. And, and, and it could be caught like that. And when people had leprosy, it would require the priests to declare that they were clean so that they could go back out into society. But here's the thing about leprosy. I saw pictures of it. I did a research on it one time. Because I thought, well, wait a minute. Why were the other ones healed, but this man was made whole? What, what's the difference? And so I saw pictures of people that had leprosy. Some of them were missing their fingers. One guy was missing a head just like that. Another guy had half his nose off. Another guy had part of his jaw that was eaten by leprosy. So leprosy was not just something that looked like a very bad skin disease. It was something that literally would eat away at your human flesh. That your, your, your body parts, bones would, would just rot or whatever with the disease. So people would know that you were scarred if you had leprosy. They would know that, that, that you had some kind of loss potentially. Everybody would know that you had leprosy because of something that it did to your body to show the effects of it, right? So these nine are walking away and they're all looking at each other. Hey, Bartholomew, we're healed. Yes, Ezekiel, we are healed. And, and they're going on and they're healed. But as they're saying it, they're, they're missing fingers. Bartholomew, we're healed. Yes, I hope I can smell because half my nose is gone. Right? They still have evidence of the scarring, the pain, the season, the suffering, the loss. And yet they kept going. But the one who maybe he had a missing nose, an ear, thought, wait a minute. I'm so grateful. God, you made it about me. I need to personally thank you. 
And he turned around and he went loudly, thanking Jesus and worshiping him. Thank you. And all he was was healed. And we know that he must have had scarring, pain, loss, proof that he was a leper because he was only healed. And Jesus said, whoa, look at what he says. He said, wait, where's the other ones? Now look at what verse 9. He doesn't pronounce him healed. Notice what he pronounced him. He said, there are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this only one. And then look at what he says in verse 19. He says, go thy way, for thy faith has made you what? Whole. Every one of them, all ten lepers healed, but there was still, including the one that returned, there must have been evidence of missing body parts, scarring, loss. Everybody would know that you were a leper or something because there was proof. There was a residing residual effect. Something was still showing that you had leprosy. But when he returned, he went from healing to wholeness. Watch this. As if it never, ever happened. Pastor Hank, you don't know the pain of the last two years. You don't know the hardships of my life and the scarring and the trauma and the stress. Really? I may not know. But are you ready for Jesus to tell you in 2022, you are whole? Are you ready for him to say, hey, I'm about to take your life of pain, loss, scarring, hardship, harshness and I'm about to pronounce it never ever happened there's no more proof there's no more evidence no more pain no more scarring no more struggle and you get a new season are you ready for that this is what he's trying to tell us some of you have been through things and it's hurt you it's wounded you You want to give up. Listen, you have a choice. You can go your way and and, and be like the nine. Yeah, God did something good for you. But there's still evidence and proof of your former season that about took everything from you. And sometimes people will enter into a new year. Well, yeah, they'll ask God for something new, but they keep taking their baggage their loss their pain their struggle their frustration into the next year and god is trying to say to you you need to position your faith and even for america i believe a wholeness is coming to this nation that it is not going to be what we have seen on our streets what we see in our politics I believe that there is coming such a God divine reset, reversal, and a rebirthing of this nation. It'll be as though it never happened. You say, I don't believe that. Listen, I can prove to you there are prophecies that God prophesied before this season. He said it would be harsh. He said there would be a plague. But before that, he prophesied that there would come a day in America where people would say, I remember when. And it was almost as though there was a generation that could not identify with what they were wanting them to remember. Because the season had drastically changed. They couldn't identify with it. And I believe that as God continues to pull this cover off of this government, off of the election, off of the vaccinations, off of the virus, off of the masks. We are going to see God do such a wholeness that is almost going to be, and I'm not saying that doesn't take away or ignore the pain or the loss or the death that maybe some have experienced. I'm telling you in the new season, it's almost going to be as though it never happened. Because of the divine order, of what God will do now. Is it going to come by complaining? No, it's not. It's going to come by being thankful and grateful for what God is doing. Pastor Doug, can you close us? Amen. How many got that? All right, let's say this. So you that are watching, 2022 
What do you want me to do for you? You know what I want you to do for me, God? Only you can do this for our nation. Make it as though this season that we went through as a nation, it never happened because of the beauty and the celebration of your reset, your reversal, and the rebirthing of your divine plan in this land. And I even pray that over the people too, Lord. I believe the scarring, the pain, the trauma, the stress, God, the injury, we're not just asking to be healed. We are asking for such a divine intervention of your grace and your hand that it will be like with that one that returned, God. We give you thanks ahead of time like it never, ever happened in our life. We are completely free. 2020 new. <laughs> it's a new season, and we thank you for it. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you, Pastor Doug. Give Pastor a hand. How many of you are thankful for what God's doing in your life? what he's doing in this nation. What a wonderful time to be alive. We can witness all this and the greatest harvest that we've ever seen in the midst of it. It's an exciting time to be alive. Well, altar team, if you would come up here now, I wanna give them a chance to work their way up to the front. If you need prayer this morning, you're not 100% assured of your salvation, or you need healing in your body, or you have a relationship issue that you need prayer for, our altar team ministry is here. I want to say goodbye to our online audience. Thank you for watching and joining us today. Don't forget Wednesday night, Pastor Hank will be in the house. Don't forget, if you haven't got your Christmas in space ticket, you can get that today, the last opportunity right now as you leave in the Connect shop. Go have a wonderful day. We'll see you Wednesday night. Thank you.